Hi everyone, my name is Mohamed Feli and today I'd like to discuss with you cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So what do we know about cardiovascular disease and diabetes? We know that there is an increased risk for cardiovascular disease in people living with diabetes. You are two to five times more likely to have or die of cardiovascular disease when compared to non-diabetics. So, what can you do about it? How can you reduce your risks? Does managing your blood sugar levels matter? What should your goals be? In order to understand this question, you first need to know what your cardiovascular risk factors are. Some of the most common cardiovascular risk factors are your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your weight and your waist circumference. So what can you do about it? Well, for starters, you can manage your blood sugar better. You can remember that diabetes is not just about taking your medicine. It is about how you live your life as well and your lifestyle choices. And be aware of what your goals are for your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your waist circumference, your weight and your other cardiovascular risk factors. So let's discuss blood sugar management. The truth is that reducing your blood sugar to a goal that you and your doctor have agreed upon is useful. This is a concept that we refer to as control. So what indicates control? Well, we use a test called glycated hemoglobin or HbA1c. But what is this concept? This is a test that tells you your average blood sugar over a period of 3 to 4 months or 90 to 120 days. You should discuss this goal with your doctor. Do you know what your goal is? Is your goal less than 6.5%, less than 7% or less than 8%? Discuss your goal with your doctor. Negotiate your goal with your doctor. But how do you achieve this goal? Number one is to take your medicine regularly. Number two is to engage in moderate intensity exercise such as brisk walking five to seven times a week. And lastly, visit a dietitian and work out a diet plan that works best for you. But how will you know if you are achieving your goal? Well, let's go back to what you can test. You can test your blood sugar. So what should your blood sugar goals be? Ideally, if you are targeting an HbA1c or glycated hemoglobin of less than 6.5%, your target fasting glucose level should be between 4 and 7 millimoles per liter and your target sugar level 2 hours after a meal should be less than 8 millimoles per liter. If you are targeting a glycated hemoglobin level of less than 7%, then your target fasting sugar level should be between 4 and 7 millimoles per liter and you can have a little bit less control 2 hours after your meal but your target blood sugar level should be less than 10 millimoles per liter. If your target glycated hemoglobin is less than 8%, then your target fasting blood sugar level should be between 4 and 7 millimoles per liter and your target blood sugar levels 2 hours after a meal should be less than 12 millimoles per liter. What do we know about reducing your HbA1c? How does this reduce your cardiovascular risk? Well, we know that for every 1% reduction you can achieve in HbA1c or glycated hemoglobin, you can reduce your diabetes-related deaths by up to 21% and the number of heart attacks over a 10-year period by up to 14%. This shows us the importance of reducing your glycated hemoglobin levels. So, <clears throat> When you reduce your glycated hemoglobin levels, you should also be wary of very low blood sugar levels. One large clinical trial and one very small clinical trial has taught us that there is an increased risk of death from very low blood sugar levels. Very low blood sugar levels can also increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, Know the symptoms of low or very low blood sugar levels, such as dizziness, sweating, confusion, 
and even faster heartbeats. Remember to report these to your doctor or your healthcare professional when you meet them, as this might indicate that you need to change your glycated hemoglobin levels for a small period of time. Next, let's discuss blood pressure. Your blood pressure is made up of two components, namely your systolic blood pressure, which is a measure of the pressure when your heart contracts your diastolic blood pressure, which is a measure of the pressure when your heart relaxes. Have you ever been told you have high blood pressure? Well, what is this? High blood pressure is where your systolic blood pressure is greater than or equal to 140 and or your diastolic blood pressure is greater than or equal to 90. But what do these numbers really tell us? Well, we know that high blood pressure increases your risk for cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks and stroke. So, what should your blood pressure goals be? Ideally, you should speak to your physician because these numbers tend to change from country to country and they depend on where you live. In South Africa, we suggest a systolic blood pressure that is between 130 and 139 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure of between 80 and 89 millimeters of mercury. So how can you achieve this? Firstly, take your blood pressure medicines regularly. We know that all blood pressure medicines are equally useful in reducing your cardiovascular risk. Next, do cardiovascular exercise. You should aim to do at least 30 minutes on most days per week of either jogging or brisk walking. Cut down on your salt intake. You should not be having more than 6 grams of salt per day. Cutting down your salt intake to less than 6 grams of table salt will reduce your blood pressure by between 2 to 8 millimeters of mercury. Cut down your alcohol intake. You should not be having more than 2 drinks per day. Reducing your alcohol intake to less than 2 drinks per day will reduce your blood pressure by between 2 to 4 millimeters of mercury. Don't smoke or quit smoking. Smoking cessation has been linked to reducing your cardiovascular risk. Next, let's discuss your cholesterol. We know that high cholesterol is common in patients living with diabetes. This is commonly referred to as diabetic dyslipidemia. But what is this? Well, you have different types of cholesterol. The first type of cholesterol that we're going to discuss is the high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. This is commonly referred to as your good cholesterol because it's known to prevent heart disease. The second type of cholesterol is your low-density lipoproteins, which is commonly referred to as your bad cholesterol because it has been linked to cardiovascular disease and risk. The third type of cholesterol is your total cholesterol. This is basically a combination of or total of your high density lipoprotein cholesterol, your low density lipoprotein cholesterol and a fourth type of cholesterol called your triglycerides. Your triglycerides are usually higher than normal, especially if you have diabetic dyslipidemia. But what really are these? Essentially, these are a measure of your cardiovascular risk. So how often should your cholesterol be measured? Your cholesterol should ideally be measured at least once a year, and you should discuss the results of your cholesterol measurement with your physician. You've probably heard that high cholesterol blocks up your arteries. While this is an oversimplification, high cholesterol does result in reduced blood flow in your arteries and can cause heart attacks strokes, and even diabetic foot disease. So what should your cholesterol goals be? Ideally, you should strive to reach the following goals if you live in South Africa. A total cholesterol of less than 4.5 millimoles per liter, a high-density lipoprotein cholesterol of greater than 1.02 millimoles per liter in men and greater than 1.20 millimoles per liter in women. Remember that high-density lipoproteins is your good cholesterol and having a higher number is generally considered better. 
you should aim for a triglyceride level of less than 1.7 millimoles per liter and an LDLC level or low density lipoprotein cholesterol level of less than 1.8 millimoles per liter. It is important to remember that for every 1 millimole per liter reduction you achieve in low, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, you can have up to a 23% reduction in major cardiovascular events and up to a 17% reduction in stroke. So how can you reduce your cholesterol? Well firstly you can take your prescribed medication regularly. The mainstay of cholesterol treatment is a group of drugs commonly referred to as statins. You've probably heard both good and bad things about statins. But what we know for sure is that statins reduce the risk of a heart attack or stroke and are generally well tolerated, although some people may experience muscle pain. If you are taking a statin and experience side effects of the drug, remember to speak to somebody who has experience in advising you about your medicines. So talk to either your doctor or your pharmacist about the medicine that you are taking. Do not just simply stop taking your medicine. What about some lifestyle changes that you can make to reduce your cholesterol? Well firstly let's discuss diet. Reducing your intake of saturated fats, trans fats and cholesterols may be useful. Avoiding fatty meats, processed foods and even confectionery foods may be helpful. Increasing your dietary intake of fiber and avoiding refined carbohydrates such as sugar may also be useful. With regards to exercise, Doing about 30 minutes of brisk walking on all or most days per week will reduce your cardiovascular risk. It will also reduce your blood pressure and will improve your blood sugar control. Cutting out your smoking or stopping smoking will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about today is with regards to your weight and your waist circumference. The question is, how do we standardize your weight measurements while we understand that all people are different? The truth is that we use a concept called the body mass index. It is a formula that gives us the ratio of your weight compared to your height. However, we know that body mass index or BMI is not enough. Putting on fat in your abdominal area also increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and worsens your blood sugar control. The truth is that your weight and waist circumference goals depend on your ethnic background. So in order to find out what your goals are, remember to talk to your healthcare provider. Learn about what your goals are, as they may be different from other people. So how do we reduce this problem? Well, let's discuss diet first. There is no one-size-fits-all diet. People are different and have different relationships with food. Also, everybody has a different ethnic background. As a result of that, it's better to discuss the diet that you think you can follow with your dietitian. Remember that almost all diets will help you to lose weight, but how many diets will help you to keep the weight off when it is over? What about exercise? Ideally, you should do 40 minutes of exercise per day at least for 6 days in a week or a total of 240 minutes of exercise per week. Maybe you could try some medicines. The truth is that if you are struggling to lose weight and are motivated to do so, medicines might be an option for you. Thus, I suggest that you discuss this option with your healthcare professional. There is no one solution to losing weight. As a result of that, you may need a combination of these different methods in order to help you to lose weight. But what are the benefits of losing weight? We know that for every 10 kilograms of weight that you lose, you can reduce your blood pressure by between 5 to 20 millimeters of mercury. We also know from a large study called Look Ahead that if you reduce your weight by 5 to 10 percent, you will require less medicines to control your diabetes and also less medicines to reduce your cardiovascular risk. So what is the take-home message? 
Well, firstly, I suggest that you ask what the goals are for your diabetes and your cardiovascular risk factors. Then, I suggest you remember what they are and ask regularly if you are achieving them. And lastly, remember to be proactive. You are the one that is in control of your condition, not your doctor, not your diabetes educator, nobody but you. Thank you very much and I hope that you've enjoyed this particular video. If you'd like to, like, comment, share and subscribe to this channel.